Excited Utterance, the Evidence and Proof Podcast, Episode 112, ETL Drawer, Cognitive Bias in Forensic Pathology Decisions. Welcome to Excited Utterance. I'm your host, Ed Chang from Vanderbilt Law School. Excited Utterance is your podcast for cutting-edge scholarship and developments in the world of evidence. We bring virtual workshops to you throughout the academic year. This week, our guest is ETL Drawer. ETL is a senior researcher in cognitive neuroscience at University College London, where his research focuses on perception, judgment, and decision-making. Our podcast today features ETL's recent article, Cognitive Bias in Forensic Pathology Decisions, which was co-authored with six others and published in the Journal of Forensic Science. In it, ETL and his co-authors report on a psychological study that suggests that the determinations of forensic pathologists are affected when they're exposed to what the authors argue is irrelevant non-medical information. I should note at the outset that this paper and its conclusions has proven to be quite controversial. Michael Peet, the editor-in-chief of the Journal of Forensic Sciences, noted that during his tenure, no article in the journal had generated more commentaries and responses. And these commentaries, many of which were critical, have in fact been published by the Journal of Forensic Sciences along with the author's responses. To my mind, the controversy and the strong emotions that were provoked by the article only serve to emphasize the importance of the issues that it raises. It asks fundamental questions about the proper role of the forensic pathologist, the types of evidence that such an expert should consider, and more broadly, what kinds of expert evidence we want, as well as the role of Bayesian theory in legal proof. I hope you'll enjoy my conversation with ETL. ETL, delighted to have you on Excited Utterance. Welcome. I'm happy to be here. So, super interesting paper. There's lots to discuss, but Before we get into the details or the broader conceptual debates, I think we should start with just the topic, forensic pathology. Can you just briefly tell us what forensic pathology is and in particular the kinds of decisions that you were focusing on? Well, that's a very big answer. I'll make it very short. And I'm not the person uh, to answer that question because I'm a cognitive expert on human decision-making, human perception and judgment and not an expert on forensic science or forensic pathology. But in a nutshell, many of the criminal cases involve scientific findings and forensic experts fit into it. And one of the most important one is forensic pathologists who, when there's a body and they do an autopsy and they do toxicological and other examination, and they draw a conclusion that forensic pathologists draw all over the world is the cause of death. This person died from hemorrhaging or from the lack of oxygen to the brain and so on and so forth. This is the cause of death. In some countries, like the United States, they don't only determine the cause of death, but the manner of death. And the manner of death, they have five options to determine that it is natural death, it's an accidental death, it's homicide, it is suicide, or that it's undetermined. They cannot decide whether it's natural, accidental, homicide, or suicide. And the cause of death is more restricted, and both of them are problematic, but the manner of this is more problematic if they decide, and based on what they decide, for example, if someone died as a result of suicide or homicide, or it's an accident, because that, of course, has great implication to the legal system if it's a homicide or not, or why they decided to die. And you can just start talking about George Floyd and the decisions around that, and you understand what we're uh, talking about. 
And what in particular motivated the study? So what was the concern that you had about these determinations of manner of death? The concern generally in evidence in the court and scientific evidence and forensic scientific evidence that it's presented by experts, scientific experts that are supposedly objective and impartial. And what we find in a variety of forensic domains from fingerprinting to DNA, that in fact, there's a lot of subjectivity, a lot of judgment and a lot of bias. So the decisions that are presented in the court as scientific and objective are actually determined by irrelevant contextual information has got nothing to do with the science. Now, we have shown it in fingerprint, we've shown it in forensic anthropology, we've shown it in DNA mixture interpretation, in firearms, but forensic pathologists have kind of escaped a lot of the inquiries, whether it's a National Academy of Science 2009, or the PCAST report, or the National Commission on Forensic Science. But the concern was that the forensic pathologist decides, for example, suicide or homicide based on non-medical information. For example, with a suicide letter next to the body or not, rather than deciding based on the injuries and the medical information, they hear that there was a witness that saw somebody leaving the flat, a condo with a knife in their hand, or they see a suicide letter. There are a number of problems with that. Number one, the forensic pathologist is a medical doctor. They're not trained in handwriting. So if I want to kill my wife, I'll murder my wife, and I'll forge a suicide letter and put it next to her. And the forensic pathologist is not trained, doesn't have the skills or the expertise to know that the letter is forged. The letter needs to go to a handwriting examiner that said that the letter is forged. So information like eyewitnesses, I call it the Sherlock Holmes syndrome, or if you watch an old American TV, Dr. Quincy, MD, when the medical examiner, the pathologist forgets the role as a medical expert and takes on non-medical, irrelevant information to determine the manner of this. And then the bigger concern, they don't even acknowledge it. Then they interpret the medical uh, information based on the non-medical irrelevant. So this was kind of the bigger issue that has been shown in many, many scientific and forensic domain, except in forensic pathology. So the aim here was to examine whether non-medical irrelevant information is going to impact their manner of death determination when the medical information is identical, the same fracture, the same brooding, the same medical information, are they going to change and reach different conclusive decision on manner of death. And I say conclusive because they can always say undetermined. They don't have to say homicide or suicide or accidental. If they're not sure, they can say undetermined. So we wanted to investigate if irrelevant non-medical information can cause them to reach different decision with the same medical evidence. So what we call irrelevant here will actually prove controversial, and I want to get to that in a minute. But before we do that, I realize this is a hard question for you, but is it possible to, in a nutshell, just explain how you went about studying this problem of cognitive bias in these pathology decisions? We did two things. First of all, we looked at death certificates and looked at many death certificates. We were able to obtain a bunch of death certificates and compared what is the manner of death for children and compared white versus black and found that when the child is black relative to when the child is white, the manner of death is going to be homicide more while the white children relative to the black children, the it's going to be more accidental. Now, of course, if you read the paper and it's open access, anybody can read it, it may well be that black children are indeed murdered more and white children die more from accident. The problem with that is what we call base rate bias. It could be that it was like that 10 years ago or it's like that now, but for certain reasons, it has changed. So in the past, Black children were murdered more relative to white kids who died more from accidents. But now it's changed. But the pathologist doing 
autopsies again and again and again, tens of cases, hundreds of cases, thousands of cases, already developed an a priori expectation to associate black children more to homicide and white children more to accident. So this is one part of the paper. It has two data sets. So one data set is actual decision making that was made as reflected in death certificates, what appears as a manner of death comparing white and black children. The other data set, we gave the same medical information to a bunch of people who determine the manner of death and they got the same medical information, but we wanted to show them if irrelevant contextual information can change a decision. So we manipulated two specific things. We manipulated who brought them to the hospital, whether it was a relative, the grandmother, or whether it was a mother's boyfriend, and also whether the child was black or whether the child was white, to see if that had an impact. And we can argue or discuss in a minute what's relevant uh, or irrelevant. And basically we found that with the same exact medical evidence is presented, if the child is brought to the hospital by the grandmother and the child is white, they will believe the story that it's accidental. But if the child is black and brought to the hospital by the mother's boyfriend, many of them are going to say that, no, it's not true, it is a homicide. I just want to point out that indeed some of them would not determine and said undetermined. So a bunch of them said undetermined, but still we got a very strong effect, a lot of statistical effect of many who will change their decision based on those two issues. Now, there was some criticism from your commentators about your choice of those experimental conditions, that you had an African-American child with the caretaker being the mother's boyfriend and a white child with the caretaker being the child's grandmother. And I have to say, I myself was a little puzzled as to why you decided to vary two conditions in the study, both the race of the child and the caretaker status. Why did you choose to do that? So there's two issues here, and now we're going to just very briefly, I'll mention, there is a question what is relevant or not, and this comes to the heart of the matter. But before that, I say, even if I will agree that some things are relevant or not, what I want, transparency. So if its decision is not based on the medical information, but who brought the kid to the hospital, or from what neighborhood, do they come from an affluent neighborhood or a poor neighborhood, what part of the city they come from, for me, all of this is irrelevant. Now, some of them, you're right, in the critique said, oh, this is very relevant because, you know, in one part of the city, there's many homicides in another neighborhood less. And it's more common that the mother's boyfriend will kill the child versus the grandmother. This may be true, maybe not true. It's irrelevant. But even if they say it's relevant, I want transparency. And this is the key issue. I want the poetic pathologist to say this kid died as a result of a homicide and not an accident. And this decision I based only because the mother's boyfriend brought him to the hospital. If the grandmother would have brought him, I would say, no, it's not homicide. It's not a medical decision. It's only based. So at least we have transparency. They're not giving the transparency. So that's point number one. Specifically to your question, right now, this is the first ever study to look at bias with forensic pathology decision. The same thing we wanna, let's say, examine if a company has biases in hiring and we look at the data and do an experiment and show systematically that they don't hire people who are Jews and homosexuals. I can say the company is discriminating. Now, I don't know if they're discriminating against Jews or they're discriminating against overweight people, but just discriminating. It doesn't matter. The paper was not specifically about are they discriminating against fact one or two? Are they biased by to show that irrelevant non-medical information influences and can determine the manner of death so with the same medical information, they reach different conclusions. Because it's a first study, it's limited. It's a first step. We need more studies to examine to the race, whether it was who brought them in the hospital, which, by the way, one can assume implicitly that the grandmother of a white kid is white and the mother's boyfriend of a black kid is probably black. But that was implicit. The point is that the paper, it's a first paper. There's more research to do to understand what affects people specifically, 
and some were not affected. Some went to undetermined. Why would it some say undetermined and some said homicide versus accident? So there's a lot of more research. This is the first step of the first study to examine bias in forensic pathology. And we wanted to see if we can find it. So we used two variables to get a lot of power to see. We could have done three or four to say they come from you know, a bad neighborhood and uh, so on and so forth. But this is medically irrelevant. And I just want to emphasize again, they argue that it is relevant who brought the kid to the hospital. Then they're admitting to the bias. They're saying, I can't believe it that they say that it's okay that a forensic pathologist gets a dead child and the same dead child is exactly the same medical findings. If the child was brought by the grandmother, they say it's an accident. And if he was brought by the mother's boyfriend, they say this was a homicide, this is murder. That is unbelievable. This is a terrible, terrible bias. And on top of that, to add insult to injury, they're not transparent. They will never write in the medical report and appear in court and say, the only reason I say this child with homicide was murdered because he was brought to the hospital by the mother's boyfriend. If somebody else brought him to the hospital, the grandmother, I would have said it's an accident. So we have a number of issues here. So I think I understand your point about increasing the statistical power. Actually, that's a good explanation for why you would vary two at the same time. But I want to poke a little bit more at this characterization of irrelevant. And I concede your point about the transparency. I think the transparency is always important. But here's the puzzle I have in my mind about what is medically relevant or irrelevant. Your critics note that caretaker identity, and let's put the race aside because race is often viewed as different, but caretaker identity is maybe a significant risk factor for child abuse. And it seems to me that not taking into account caretaker identity is perhaps committing a base rate fallacy here. So what I'm thinking about is Kahneman and Tversky's famous green car, blue car hypothetical, where they ask, what's the probability that the car was green? And the question is, do you only rely on witness case-specific identification or whether you should take into account the base rate of blue cars and green cars? Isn't not taking into account the caretaker effectively not taking into account the base rate of green cars versus blue cars? I'll say two points. Uh, you know, what you're saying, I totally understand the argument. Point number one is that we agree on the transparency if this is not a contributing factor, but the critical factor that you decide that the child was murdered or died as a result of an accident is the base rate of where they live from, or the race, or who brought them to the hospital, you have to be transparent. The problem is they are not transparent about it and they hide it as a medical finding. And they need to very clearly say, based on the medical finding, I cannot determine if it's an accident or suicide, but because the base rates of people who live in this neighborhood or belong to this race or people who are brought to the hospital or were under the care of a step parent are more likely to die. So I'm saying it's homicide only because of that. That's point number one. Point number two, specifically about the car example, this is very different because the percentage of cars that are blue or gray is a true statistical fact. The percentage of children that die while under care of a step parent or the mother's boyfriend is a determination that is subjective by the medical examiner. Then you get here what we call the bias noble effort of the base rate which is wrong. You can say police officers, and we say that in one of the responses, police officers will stop more black men because they say the base rate of them carrying guns and knife and drugs is bigger. We say, how do you know that? Because we have a base rate of how many of them are in jail. But the reason they're in jail, because you stop them more, the more you stop them, the more you find them, the more you have a base rate. So the same here, it's not a fact that uh, the mother's boyfriend murders children more than a real relative. It's based on the forensic pathologist using this base rate. And every time they decide it to increase the base rate, the base rate increases and they do it even more. And this is the bias snowfall effect. So that percentages are totally incorrect 
in this case, in contrast to the car example, which is correct, and you see it in the literature when they show that if you bring two children to the doctor, to the family physician with the same injury, if it's a black kid, the physician is more likely to report them to social services versus it's a white kid. So all the statistics around it are problematic to say the least. And then they use the statistics to justify making more biased decision, which feeds more into the base rate. And you can see the snowball effect that I'm talking about. So those statistics are not hard statistics, like how many cars are blue or gray and red, like in the Kahneman and Tversky example. Okay, I think both of their fair points, one transparency, the other being that the base rate statistics themselves are flawed or not actually based on any scientific study. I just want to make one more point. I think our discussion is very legitimate. What you're saying is good. And the aim of the paper, and we say it, and I encourage the viewers and the people who are hearing this to read the paper. And in the paper, we say this is just to raise the issues, to have this discussion. So the pathologists, the forensic pathologists can decide what's relevant, what's not relevant. The problem is they're not willing to discuss it. You can see their letters to the editor and their attacks. This is a legitimate discussion that has not taken place. And our paper was not to say one or the other. It was to raise a first step to have a discussion that many of them, and especially the National Association of Medical Examiners, will discuss the refused. What they did, they filed complaints to the journal, requested for it to be retracted, filed complaints against me to my university. So this discussion, I don't disagree with you. And I may be wrong, and I'm willing to consider it, the paper and the research is to put it on the table to have those discussions that have not taken place. Well, let me give you a little bit more credit on that score. So you talked about transparency and you talked about the accuracy of the base rates, but I think you also raise a broader philosophical point about the kinds of evidence that medical examiners should be using in determining manner of death. I think what I see is that you would like to see them focus primarily on scientific and physical evidence that's specific to the case, as opposed to more socially contextual information. And I think they argue that using the contextual information helps them make more accurate decisions. This leads me to ask the question, is perhaps one of the chief problems here, the fact that the legal system is using medical examiner reports inappropriately to the extent that medical examiners are making determinations for public record keeping, right, for vital statistics. It seems to me that perhaps they should use all of the evidence that's at their disposal, but the legal system is using their conclusions as if they're purely scientific and not based on all of this additional socially contextual information. And so maybe the legal system has to recalibrate or think about whether or not these are reports that the court should be using at all. Uh, Two points. First of all, I'm not against them using social contextual information, but I want them to do it in the right way. And we have a technique called linear sequential unmasking, LSU. Linear sequential unmasking doesn't say don't use it, but don't start with it. So you need to start with the more relevant information, the medical, you need to start with the more objective information, and you need to start with the less biasing information because the order of the information that experts get has huge effect. There's a lot of literature on order effect of information. You get the same information in a different order. You reach a different conclusion because you develop hypotheses and whatever and draw attention to different stuff based on the initial information. So linear sequential unmasking, LSU, said, yes, you can use information that is less relevant, contextual, less objective, more biasing, but not in the beginning. So this is an idea that we've thrown around and asking forensic pathologists and other forensic experts to do. Point number two, specifically about misuse of science in the court to misusing the forensic pathologists in the courtroom, you're absolutely right. The legal adversarial system is very problematic and every side is going to use and misuse as much as possible. So it's a duty of the expert, of the pathologist, of the fingerprint examiner, of the DNA examiner to minimize it, to be very clear in the report. The scientific medical evidence says this and this, 
I cannot determine if the child died as a result of accident or homicide. If you want to take social contextual non-scientific information, then I would tend to say the child, because he was brought to the hospital by the mother's boyfriend and came from this neighborhood, I would probably guess that it's a homicide and not an accident, but this is not based on scientific finding. If they write that very clearly in the report, then they're doing their job of conveying correctly to the court the strengths of the evidence, transparency, and what is scientific and what is not. You know, when I teach at university, I always tell the students, this is a matter of fact, ABC. Now I'm going and giving you my opinion. This is not scientific, this is interpretation. And this is the role of any expert and any scientist to communicate what they're saying is theoretical, it's disputed, it's not disputed, it's scientific or not, and so on and so forth. Two final questions for you. First question is that your article has generated a great deal of controversy within the medical examiner and forensic pathologist community. Did you expect this reaction when you started the project? And what do you think is the source of the animosity or the amount of emotional capital that's being spent? So this is my opinion, not a scientific fact. Let me clarify. I expected it to some degree because I've been here before when we came out showing that fingerprint examiners, the same fingerprint examiner looking at the same pair of fingerprints can reach different conclusions based off we tell them that the suspect had an alibi or not, or if they confessed or not the fingerprint examiners would reach different conclusion and even DNA mixture interpretation, there was a pushback. I expected one here. I didn't expect it to be so personal and nasty because I expected it to be a scientific debate, a hot scientific debate, which is good for science and good for the criminal justice system. I didn't expect this level of personal ad hominem attack against my co-authors, against me, trying to silence us. And again, they do need context. I accept that medical forensic pathologists need context. The same thing CSI, crime scene investigators, and digital forensic and accounting forensic, the whole range of forensic domains that need a lot of context to do their job. And medical doctors accept this is what's mind boggling. They say, well, we're medical doctors. We need everything. The medical profession in healthcare accept that there is biases in healthcare, even in medical devices. So this is a bit puzzling to me and being a bit of a, shall we say, very unpleasant. You know, I had a hearing in my university. They complained, formal complaints to the journal, requested retraction. It has been, I said in a British way, quite interesting, but the personal abuse is one thing. The other is worrying about the legal justice system. The criminal justice system, to be doing a good job, they need to reflect. They need to change. No system is perfect. No expert in any domain, from being cognitive science to medical doctors to forensic to any domain, we learn from our mistakes. We reflect all the time. But if they refuse to have a discussion and to hear other views, the system doesn't improve themselves. If we want policing and the criminal justice system to improve, that bothers me more than the personal insult, the not willingness to enter a discussion. In the beginning, when it came out, I told the president of the National American Association of Medical Examiners, bring me to your conference and let's have a debate, have a panel, put whoever you want on the panel and I'll present my view and we'll have a discussion. They were not interested. This bothers me more because this, you know, arguing is one thing, but sending innocent people to jail or having murders go away free because wrong forensic pathologist decisions is much more troubling. The last final question, what's next? Where does your project go from here? That's a good question. Well, first of all, it's not my project. It should be project in this area of the criminal justice system and forensic pathology to start having a professional debate, trying to classify information, what is always relevant, what is never relevant, what is sometimes relevant, coming to discuss the issues of youth contextual information, developing techniques like linear sequential unmasking LSU, how you can use contextual information and even information that is less objective and less relevant to use it and optimize 
and to be transparent. So I'm continuing to do research, but not only in forensic pathology, but in many other forensic domain, and not only forensic domain, but in medical and other domains that I work. When I look at expert errors, but experts that are hardworking, dedicated, competent experts, and they make mistakes nevertheless. But it's not my project. It's a project of all of us to do research, to think about it, to improve any system. But we all, I think, can agree that the legal system, the criminal justice system, is not working especially well. And I say it in a very British way. We really need to think how to move forward and improve it. Well, ETL, thanks for an extremely thought-provoking discussion, not only from the standpoint of your article, but also more broadly about the proper role of medical examiner reports in the legal system. Great having you on the show. I just want to point out that the paper and all the criticism is open access, freely and publicly available, and I encourage everyone to read the article, to hear what we actually say, to read the criticism, and consider it. It's all out there so you can form your own opinion and, and make your own judgments. Every year in my evidence class, I teach a video clip of a county medical examiner who changes his conclusions on the victim's manner of death after hearing about the defendant's confession. The technical evidentiary question that I ask is whether the confession is a proper basis for the expert's opinion under Federal Rule of Evidence 703. Specifically, is it reasonable for a medical examiner to rely on such non-scientific testimonial evidence in forming his opinion? The answer to this question is not at all clear to me. On the one hand, you can imagine juries, or even judges acting as fact finders, wanting to hear from a medical examiner about what the scientific evidence has to say about manner of death. That is, without the injection of a potentially unreliable confession or potentially unreliable other contextual information. After all, the legal actors are perfectly capable, or at least assumed to be perfectly capable, of assessing the confession evidence. What the legal actors need help with is the medical, toxicological, and other scientific evidence that is in the case. On the other hand, the medical examiner performs a multifaceted role in our society. For one thing, the medical examiner often reaches a conclusion for purposes of official vital statistics on things like homicides, accidental deaths, and the like. For that purpose, it would seem rather silly to restrict the kinds of evidence that the medical examiner uses. But even for the purpose of testifying in court, does it make sense to hamstring medical examiners in terms of the evidence that they can look at? I've always been able to see the arguments cutting both ways. The controversy between ETL and his co-authors and their critics similarly strikes at a core philosophical question regarding legal proof. To their medical examiner critics, Evidence of the identity of the caregiver is surely relevant. If certain caregivers or family structures make child abuse more likely, then they need to know the identity of the caregiver. Race is obviously a much more controversial question, and we might exclude that kind of information for policy reasons, but surely it's not irrelevant. Indeed, as I suggested in the interview, all of this seems to me a variant of the base rate problem that is raised famously in the green car, blue car hypothetical in Kahneman and Torsky. If a witness is 80% accurate and says that the car was blue, the probability that the car was indeed blue depends not only on that witness's testimony, but also on the base rate of blue cars. If blue cars are rare, even with an 80% eyewitness accuracy, the chance that the car was actually blue can still be quite low. But ETL and his co-authors respond to this argument with some classic concerns. For one thing, 
the probabilities used for base rates may not be valid. That's fair enough. But what if, as in the case of caregiver risks, there are scientific studies? Then it's not so easy to run from the base rates then. Alternatively, perhaps it's not fair for a defendant to be convicted on the basis of population-based data, since each instance is an individual case. This is an argument that ETL and his co-authors make in their responses. But that kind of argument raises the classic statistical proof paradoxes, like the famous blue bus problem. But then again, blue bus typically only applies to naked statistical proof, the use of statistics without any other evidence. And we don't really have that situation here with the medical examiners. So what we're left with is a conundrum. What ETL study shows is that information like caregiver identity can change a forensic pathologist's outcome. What remains controversial, though, is whether that change is bias in the sense that it should be rooted out, or whether that change is justified on Bayesian grounds as an incorporation of base rates. This question, it seems to me, isn't really a scientific one. Rather, it's an expression of legal values and the theory about the proper role of a forensic expert at trial. Both of these questions are ones deserving of respectful and reflective academic debate. And to my mind, without the outrage and recriminations that ETL's article seems to have provoked. Support for Excited Utterance is generously provided by Vanderbilt Law School's Brandstetter Litigation and Dispute Resolution Program, as well as the University of Arkansas School of Law. The associate producer is Alex Nunn, and the production editor is Madeline DiPietro. Additional production assistance is provided by Francesca Rutherford, and music was provided by the Vanderbilt University Blair School of Music's Children's Cello Choir, under the direction of Kirsten Castle Greer. I'm your host, Ed Chang, and I hope you'll join us again next time when we take on another new work in the world of evidence and proof. <laughs>